Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar that is part of the webinar series, the, uh, the Qualitative Methods Masterclass webinar series, which is a partnership between uh, IIQM at the University of Alberta, Atlas TI, and the University of Georgia. I'm Ricardo Contreras, and I will be uh, introducing this presentation. Uh, today, we have Dr. Sally Thorne from the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia who is going to present introduction uh, to interpretative descriptive methodology. Um, uh, let me say a few words about uh, the structure of this presentation, uh, and then um, uh, we will start. So first of all, let me say that uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded, and you are going to receive uh, the video of this presentation about three hours after the, the webinar is over. Uh, please check. Uh, your spam folder in case that message is not in your inbox. Uh, Dr. Thorne will be speaking for about 40 minutes or so, and, um, and uh, after that, she's going to proceed to answer your questions. However, uh, please know that you may write down your questions uh, in the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, you can practice now saying hi to me. In fact, uh, why don't you do this? Why don't you write down uh, the country where you're located? You know, and I will be able to see that. Uh, so while she is presenting, uh, please go ahead and ask your questions and we would be more than happy to, uh, to, 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 to answer them after uh, the presentation is over. And we have people coming from Denmark, UK, Canada, uh, Italy, uh, the US, India, Switzerland, uh, two from Italy, I see. Chile, ah, Jose Pavez from Chile. I'm from Chile too, so we have there <laughs> somewhere from my country. All right, so that's wonderful. We have so many people from so many different places. Uh, so uh, uh, that is all uh, for me now. And uh, your microphone, just one more thing, will remain muted uh, so that we don't have echo and we don't have uh, background noise. Now I would like to ask my colleague from IIQM, Juliana Barabas, uh, to say a few words introducing Dr. Thorne. Thank you so much, Ricardo, for uh, that opening and to Atlas TI, of course, for this ongoing webinar series of the support. Sally Thorne is a professor and former director of the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia. She has a long-standing research program in the field of patient experience and relational practice in chronic illness and cancer care, in addition to a body of scholarly work in philosophy of science, the nature of evidence, and applied qualitative methodology. She is the author of four books, including the popular qualitative research text on interpretive description, a method she first wrote in 1997 and has continued to develop. Thorne is editor-in-chief of the scholarly journal Nursing Inquiry, as well as associate editor for Qualitative Health Research. She is a fellow of both the Academy, American Academy of Nursing and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Please help me in welcoming Sally Thorne. Thank you very much, Juliana. Now I will give the, the control of the session uh, to Dr. Thorne. So let me make you the presenter. And now, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo and Juliana. Um, I'm Sally Thorne, and I am thrilled to have this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics. You will find it's a little bit of a whirlwind introduction to um, the topic, and I probably won't be able to answer all of the questions that you've got, but I will hopefully convey to you some of my excitement about what this method is all about, how you might be able to take it up and use it, and what role it plays in the methodological spectrum of our qualitative world. Specifically, this method is designed for the applied and practice disciplines. And by that, I mean the disciplines that exist for the purpose of doing something in the world, enacting something in the world. 
And they are, I believe, quite different from the disciplines that exist for the purpose of theorizing and thinking about the world. And I'll be referring to them as the social science disciplines. So nursing and medicine and education and social work and those kinds of disciplines would be applied and practice disciplines. And I maintain that they have different relationships to knowledge and a different need for knowledge than do the social sciences. As we know, the foundations of the qualitative methods that are commonly used, and they're in all your textbooks, um, are in the social sciences. And they are beautifully designed for the intellectual purposes that those disciplines um, intended. So over many, many years, those disciplines have evolved methodological traditions and conventions that suit the nature of the knowledge that they're developing. And these are just three examples, but they happen to be three of the most common um, in the health sciences. I believe very strongly that our applied and practice disciplines give us an epistemological positioning that I would refer to as our disciplinary hardwiring that is a very profound relationship to knowledge, an understanding of how knowledge works and why it works in a certain way. And it is that which is the primary driver of why we do research, what kind of research we do, what kind of form it needs to take in order to have impact in the world. So I'm going to be referring a lot to that idea of what, how we're epistemologically hardwired in our applied and practice disciplines to see the world in a certain way. And I'm a nurse and I'll illustrate that by virtue of nursing and what it looks like in, for, for nursing, but invite you to think about what, how that would work in whatever your applied and practice discipline might be. So for example, Nurses always see human experience in, as wholes and parts in interaction. A patient may come into your clinic with a, uh, an abdominal pain, but we're not simply looking at an abdominal pain. We're looking at a whole person and the other parts of the person, whether it be biological or psychological or social, in relation to that, that presenting part. And that way of thinking back and forth between wholes and parts is absolutely fundamental to the way we always think in nursing. We always also deal with the world of ideas and interpretation. It's never the body in front of us on the hospital gurney, but it's the, the uh, ideas that that individual holds, where they came from, what they think, what they think is going on. And that is the stuff that nursing is working with. Similarly, nursing is always concerned about commonalities in its knowledge. It might be very interested in what many patients might experience when they have a certain kind of condition. But the most important aspect of its thinking is that notion of difference. Nursing is extremely concerned with individualizing and understanding and therefore being able to detect that which is different in the patient you have before you today or the experience that you are, are uh, observing. And that moving back and forth between commonalities and differences is absolutely fundamental to nursing. Nursing practice, as it becomes more and more excellent, has to do with a refined capacity to be able to spot difference and know how to interpret it and what to do with it. So all of those mean that we have a kind of a different relationship to knowledge for practice than the kinds of knowledge that you might expect from conventional biomedical science, for example, or from social science. We never assume that the knowledge we're developing today is going to be the end of the line and that we will have solved all problems. We never assume at the end of a study that we have reached the definitive answer. We always recognize and expect that five years from now, we will understand things better than we do right now, and 10 years from now, even further. So we think about knowledge and therefore our contributions to knowledge as researchers and scholars as being part of an ongoing and evolving process, having to have that flexibility and being infinitely adaptive. So all of this is happening in the context, a very wide context for nursing, of an evidence imperative in healthcare. Uh, the world of claims that are going to be uh, enacted in policy and practice are often going to be those that can attach themselves to the ongoing discussion of what constitutes uh, appropriate evidence. So that's a wider context in which we're doing all of this work. And the nature of this clinical knowledge 
that we're focusing on um, has to do with these patterns and processes that affect clinical reasoning. We definitely are interested in theoretical knowledge. It's not irrelevant to us and empirical knowledge, but we are always taking this into the clinical observation context to recognize patterns and then to recognize a potentially infinite variation on those patterns driven by the ultimate ideal uh, in nursing epistemology, which is getting as close as you possibly can to that theoretical ideal of knowing the patient. And that is a, a, a kind of a depiction of how the core structure of how knowledge works for nursing. I've depicted it in the context of, of an individual, a patient, but the same would be the case for a nurse educator trying to think about how to focus on students or someone trying to figure out how to, how to serve communities or, or groups. And it's that structure of knowledge that repeats itself in the way in which our discipline might think about knowledge. And uh, if you have a different discipline, I really invite you to reflect on what that might look like in your discipline. So historically then, when we started to do qualitative research in nursing, which was, was quite early on in the early uh, 1980s, um, we ran into all kinds of resistances for the use of this research, primarily resistance from our biomedical colleagues um, who understood a particular kind of science, quantitative science was at that time the, the one and only way to go forward. And so this thing we were doing um, was quite a departure from it and there was quite a bit of resistance. We also, however, had uh, resistance from social science colleagues who might think, gosh, you took one or two courses in a doctoral program that does not make you into a sociologist or an anthropologist. They might see what we're doing as a, a very uh, inappropriate departure from what they had spent years in training to study. So on both sides, we, we um, had lots of resistance and we had to try and defend the logic of this kind of research to grant reviewers, journal editors and others. So in the early years of qualitative work in health sciences, we became extremely rule bound. And the, we held the idea that a high quality study was essentially uh, naming a method and then following religiously along with the rule structures that was set up. Uh, and yet this did not particularly work well much of the time. We, it's not that we couldn't adapt ourselves to learning the social science method, but we would then be producing a study that was uh, uh, mimicking the method and not meeting our disciplinary needs. Or we would be modifying the method a little bit in order to try and meet our disciplinary needs because there are some fundamental differences in that relationship to knowledge between the applied and the social science disciplines. Just for an example, the idea, uh, the phenomenological tradition of bracketing your preconceptions and putting them aside makes tremendous sense for uh, a human psychological phenomenological exploration. But in the context of the kinds of questions we might be asking in an applied discipline, we would expect to be building on a solid knowledge of what's already known and how is it known. Grounded theory similarly um, has, has many ideas that aren't quite consistent with much of the way we would be taking it up. We would, for example, be very interested in individuals' interpretations of why they were doing a certain thing, which might um, you know, be a bit of a violation from a grounded theory assumption that tacit knowledge that's be below human consciousness is more likely driving the behavior of social organization. And similarly with that ethnography, just to illustrate a few very, very briefly, um, we are, of course, in nursing are interested in cultural impacts on health and health behaviors, but we're very rarely prepared to be studying a whole culture. And, and nor are we assuming that a whole culture is necessarily relevant to a health question because of those individual variations and in how somebody might take up that culture. So there's all kinds of differences in the philosophical understandings of what it is you're doing and why, and therefore how it is you need to build in methodological rules that created some significant disjunctures between the conventional methods we were trying to take up meticulously and the nature of the knowledge that we needed. We also had to deal with funding body requirements um, that uh, indicated certain aspects of our research design 
um, that came from the other kinds of science. So for example, it's pretty well impossible to get ethical review or to uh, apply for funding and have your project funded if you don't predetermine a sample size. We build our budgets and we build our plans around that. And in the quantitative world, we all understand very well uh, that that is a fundamental mathematical property of the quality of a study to, to create um, the kinds of results that are going to uh, demonstrate um, something that you can, can consider valid and reliable. In the qualitative world, a sample size is a, a very different kind of thing, and it's a predetermined um, uh, it's a predetermined number that you put into a proposal, but that number has very little relationship to quality measures. The, the social science norms of the day um, were also driving a lot of our decisions about things like theoretical frameworks and claims like saturation of the data. Um, it, is, it, it would not be consistent with an applied disciplinary lens in my discipline to say, I've seen 10 patients with this phenomenon, or I've seen 100 patients with this phenomenon, and then therefore I can determine redundancy and I can conclude that there's nothing more that I could find. So those kinds of ideas we were taking up because they were rule structures that made tremendous sense in the social sciences from which they came and in which they were derived, but very little sense. And we had to configure all of this into uh, health sciences manuscript length that really deprived us of depths and richness, richness. So the problem was we ended up with a resultant body of qualitative research in health sciences that was well intended, but very often not meeting the purpose. It, it was characterized by some confusion of the role of theory in that kind of work, uh, often essentializing claims, things like this is the lived experience, um, where uh, you might really be saying this is what some people experience. Or some of them abdicated generalization and reported studies saying this is not, this is not generalizable beyond the 10 people that I interviewed for my study, in which case you might say, why, why bother? And then we also had a problem with overuse of metaphoric representations. Metaphor may sometimes be useful, but to squeeze and force fit a metaphor onto a set of data is not necessarily providing the kind of knowledge that could be at all helpful for clinical practice. So this is the problem into which I uh, immersed myself um, many years ago and have continued to be fascinated that we had people trying to do what they thought they were supposed to do to answer questions that they knew to be quite important, but often not being able to craft craft a credible study um, in such a way that it could, could achieve the potential that, it, that they would have hoped. My, the first paper I wrote on this topic was in 1991 after my doctoral work in which I was, I was trying to push back against that rule structure and saying, uh, sometimes when we try and follow the, these rules of, of qualitative uh, method, we can't do work that meets the needs of our discipline. And at the end of that paper, I indicated maybe someday someone will write a, a method that's more suited to the needs of the health sciences. The idea must have stuck in my mind because I continued to work on it. And by 1997, with a couple of my wonderful graduate students at the time, I wrote a paper using the term interpretive description which was never intended to be a formal method at the time, but it was a way of describing the kind of research that uh, I think represents excellent qualitative research in an applied discipline. It's always descriptive. It describes a phenomenon in, in a useful way, but it never simply describes. It always does it in a way that answers those interpretive questions, the so what. And so we, when we first published this, we did not intend it to, to, that we were on a path to create a method, but really trying to provide some license to the many, many excellent, skilled, qualitative researchers in the health sciences who were trying to justify doing work that meant, met the knowledge needs of their discipline. Might mean they were breaking a few rules according to those, the, the rules police, but they were doing it 
um, not because they were sloppy or lazy, but to really get to answering the questions of their discipline. So it's that group that we were intending this for. And we use the word non-categorical uh, as an uh, awkward attempt to say not phenomenology, not grounded theory, not ethnography. That really is the origin of the idea of interpretive description. Um, the, the language has stuck. And um, it, so it really is a description of a kind of research rather than a specific methodology that can produce one, any one kind of research. It's derived from a nursing epistemology because that's the context in which we were developing it. But I've come to believe very strongly that it works very well across a wide range of applied and practice disciplines. If you understand how the thinking of your discipline works, and what kind of knowledge it needs and why, then you can adapt the principles to any applied discipline. In, in wonderful nursing tradition, it shamelessly borrows the best of technique from the conventional methods, but it doesn't have to take along all the theoretical baggage. So in other words, if a technique is useful and it works, absolutely will we'll, uh, take it along with us. And this allows us really access to the full spectrum of possible tech, wonderful technique that's been developed in both the applied and the social sciences. Finally, it also uses theory as a tool. Theory is not irrelevant, but it, it is a tool for research, never the ultimate purpose. So these are the characteristics of this kind of research that we are calling interpretive, dis or, or, uh, interpretive description. It draws on an applied uh, disciplinary epistemology rather than borrowed theory. It allows for and encourages and invites creativity in the use of data sources and research inquiry approaches so that it invites you to say, you explain why this is a useful way to go forward. It also builds knowledge translation into the design from the very get-go, from identifying a problem to articulating a research question, deciding on how you're going to approach it and how you're going to analyze it. Uh, that means that knowledge translation is not an afterthought, but recognizing the knowledge needs out there builds that into the design from the beginning. And so the kind of knowledge that research that takes this philosophical approach can, can develop is that which is really oriented more closely toward uh, uh, relevant and usable knowledge in this world in which we are trying to develop the best directions forward from that combination of empirical science, what patients feel, and clinical wisdom. In that context, this creates knowledge that's useful. So I'll, I'll say a few things about some um, aspects of research or characteristics of research that tends to take this method. As I've said, it is not a prescribed method, is not one way to go about doing things, but a, a, an attitude, an approach toward research or a philosophy of research that allows the researcher to be able to justify those design decisions, to articulate an interior logic of a study from beginning to end that is tailor-made to meet the knowledge needs of the discipline. One of the qualities that these kinds of studies have is that they always go beyond description and theorizing into really looking at the question of, so what would this mean in the applied world, in the practice world? What would it mean if we took these ideas and used them in our thinking about patient care or, or the work that we do? It always assumes that you come into a study not with a blank slate, but with a deep and rich understanding of what are the ideas that people in my discipline or people in my applied practice field take with them? What do they currently think about this particular clinical phenomenon or this particular human experience? What ideas are, are dominant and popular? And, and what, are the, what are the arguments about those ideas? So a critically reflective understanding of 
what do we know right now? What are the gaps in that knowledge? What are the problems and debates within that knowledge? And that is always the, the entry point into, into a field if you're going to add to that knowledge. Interpretive description also doesn't have to be used as a named method. I am using interpretive description, but it can often be a term that creates a useful reference point for the scholar who is essentially using another kind of a method, taking a phenomenological approach, for example, in the, in the study of what it's like to go through a certain healthcare phenomenon, uh, but using interpretive description as a way of articulating um, and justifying the variations that you're making. So moving away from saying I am doing or being a grounded theorist, for example, you might say I'm drawing these particular elements from grounded theory design, but in an interpretive description uh, tradition, I will be doing these other things a little bit differently. So we invite people to think about how best does the use of the term uh, work in helping you explain as clearly and articulately as possible what it is that you're actually doing and what traditions are you drawing from. And if the term interpretive description helps you in doing that and in justifying that, then that's the invitation. In this tradition, we also frame our research questions a little bit differently. We would not be asking questions about the essential structure of something or the life worlds of something. Those are very much social science ways of conceptualizing the nature of knowledge and the purpose of knowledge. Instead, we'd try and think what's, what's closer to the question that I'd be asking in the clinical world. And one of the, one of the stems that, that is probably the most handy in this regard is to think about the stem, what can be learned from? What can be learned from a group of transgender youth about how they experience barriers to healthcare service? That kind of question. So it's not presupposing a particular theoretical orientation to the ideas, but it's recognizing that there is some knowledge to be gained within their subjective uh, experiential view of things that if we had it and if we could could frame it in a way that would that would make sense could be quite helpful to those who design and structure services and who try and offer care. It also invites us to think carefully about the question of theory. In the applied disciplines, theory always privileges something. It shines a light on something. It allows us to see something in a particular way. But the use of theory, particularly strongly used in a study, always obscures other things. So instead of uh, the adoption of a single theoretical framework, which is very much an understood and recognized tradition in the social sciences, uh, this method invites us to think about what are the multiple theories? What are the various theories that are most likely influencing the way I ask the question or what I expect I'll be looking for? And this, is, this assumes a very different relationship to theory that's much more similar to theory and practice. We wouldn't in nursing hand a young nurse of a particular theory and say, here's a stress and coping theory, go, go out and take care of all patients. We would offer multiple, a suitcase full of theories and over time, uh, uh, a refinement of those theories and expansion of them so that practice allows you to say, ah, this is an occasion in which this way of thinking about something can be quite helpful to me. And so it is an invitation, again, to think about the theoretical ideas that, that are, might be relevant and then to critically reflect on those along the way so that they're not dominating the study, so that they are actually guiding thinking and guiding inquiry, guiding openness to ideas, much the way they might do it in clinical practice. This approach also allows options for data sources. Nurses are famous for wanting to do individual interviewing because we never get enough time to talk to our patients and hear their stories in the practice sense. But there are many, many other ways in which um, data that's relevant might be hidden. Uh, there might be non-empirical literature, for example, documentary sources. There's much that can be gathered by observing. And uh, a, a source of data that we sometimes don't tap would be expert opinion. What are the thoughts of those clinicians or those experts in the field or those key stakeholders, those people who 
have a, a, a long-standing and uh, embedded relationship to the clinical practice field and who will have seen many cases over the course of their career and who will have critically thought about it. Uh, what can we tap from the experiences and understandings of that group that might help us generate something that could accelerate the learning um, of the next generation of practitioners? So there are many different options for data sources. And the question of sample size, as I said, is, is one that is fundamentally an artifact of the culture within which we need to do research. The fact that you can't get ethical approval unless you say how many people you're going to interview. The, the detective mind, the ongoing clinical detective mind of the clinician would say, I'm going to continue to ask these questions until I think I have some satisfactory answers. And yet we can't um, plan our research uh, in, the, in the way it's structured uh, in, in the modern world without thinking about sample size. But I encourage you very strongly to always remember that sample size is um, an artificial construct. It's a judgment. It's a best guess. It certainly is not um, anything that that um, there will ever be rule structures on. Uh, we sometimes people design their sample size with an assumption that if they interviewed 20 people at that point they would have saturation of of the theoretical perspectives and that they could conclude that that was an endpoint. But it, remember, it is not in the nature of clinical knowledge to hit endpoints and uh, to, to have reached the end of your sample or to have claimed that you have, have, have come up with all the insights there are to come up with are both problematic. So instead we say, uh, follow the rules that you need to follow. Um, think about what is within the scope of reference. If you're a doctoral student and you have the capacity to interview only 15 people, that may be uh, the right number for you. And at that point, you will be able to reflect on how much can I know? What is there still to know? Always in the context of knowledge and practice. Now, the work of data collection itself um, in all of this for, for people in health sciences and other applied sciences is sometimes fairly straightforward, some of the most straightforward parts of a, of a research study. There's still, there's lots to be said about that, but that um, the most complex part for many is the issue of data analysis. Many times people in the applied and practice disciplines can take their study all the way through data collection and have a wonderful data set and then feel immobilized and stuck not knowing what to do. So I'll say a few more words about data analysis than I will about, about data collection per se. There is lots and lots of written tradition about data analysis, much of it on coding and organizing. And it is so important to be thinking about why you are doing data analysis in an applied qualitative research study. You know, who was the audience you were thinking of when you decided that there was a knowledge need? And what is the, uh, the thinking structure of those out there that you need to, you want to be able to generate some really gorgeous and meaningful findings. So you want to be thinking about knowing your data and applying your technique being able to massage and develop that data from patterns to relationships. Much of what's there in the literature on data analysis focuses on coding and identification of themes or patterns or categories. And I would argue that much of it is an organizing structure that is pointing you toward taxonomies and generating taxonomies of things, which may or may not have any relationship to the species of knowledge that you want, rather than inviting you as the skilled thinker who understands something about the nature of your world to reflect on what insights are there in this body of literature that might reflect findings worthy of sharing with that intended audience. So analytic engagement in this way is really thinking about what do I find that was unexpected? Most of us in the applied world will find many things in, in a set of data, uh, interview transcripts, for example, we'll find many things we would have expected and we could have predicted before we went into the, the interviews themselves. But what are the things that were not expected? What are the parts that tweak our curiosity and make us ask questions? 
What are the ideas that are common in most cases and what similarities and differences can we see? see? And ultimately, as we continue to reflect, we are asking ourselves what story is emerging from these accounts that needs telling? Not what all, what is everything there? We can't account for all of our data in, in our data sets, but to say what insights are here that might be relevant to those in need of this knowledge. So that's focusing our attention on relevance, on application, right from the beginning of that analytic engagement. And as we come toward writing up findings, we're not simply itemizing a collection of things. We're not simply saying, I went into the field for three months and I have reported 14 categories. We're, we're trying to use that organizing that we do, not as the end in itself, but as a technique to get us toward a coherent narrative. I now have a different way of helping you think about this phenomenon. And I point to an, a wonderful paper that Margaret Sandalowski wrote in 2007, words that should be seen but not written. All these codes and themes and categories, we should be able to see that you did that homework and organized and reflected and, and, and worked with your data, but the findings themselves should be a, a story worth telling, an insight worth revealing. And we formulate them in a way that is designed to attract and uh, to, to appeal to that audience that we thought of at the beginning the people in our discipline or in our, in our teams or in our practice contexts who will be needing this kind of knowledge. And we recognize that that's a complex, it's not simply individuals, it's a wider context of knowledge that we are uh, articulating our findings in the context in which there's a hierarchy of evidence that people respond to and which there are competing discourses and ideas. So we take both of the existing discourses and the hierarchy of evidence into uh, our considerations as we decide how to write up findings in a way that best speak to the current science and to the current practice uh, knowledge and to the gaps in that knowledge. So the explicit contribution that this kind of applied research can can make, the, this kind of applied qualitative science can make in the field is to really focus on the things that science, conventional science misses and misunderstands. Those many aspects of human and health experience, for example, that defy quantification or that quantification misrepresents. Things that don't behave in ways that can be regularized <clears throat> and the many, many things that change outside the context of their natural complexity that are embedded in the, in the life worlds, in the social worlds, in the histories and the past and the future of the human beings that we interact with. One of the uses for this kind of research will always be a corrective to big science. And I'm thinking here of population data. It may be extremely important to know that 78% of people experience something in a certain way, but the qualitative researcher will, will point that antenna toward the, what about the other ones and why don't they? And what's the difference between the ones who do and don't? What sense should we be making of that? So we don't make policy and, and practice planning errors on the basis of simply know, knowing population data, we also have an understanding of how to bring human data into our interpretation of big science. This kind of research is really useful for, for filling gaps. Here's, here's some things that we know on the basis of the kinds of things that we can measure or study or have already been developed. I'm going to fill in the gap between things. And so, so uh, setting up our studies so that they're specifically designed to address uh, issues of, of gap in the nature of our existing knowledge is sometimes a very satisfying way to organize a study that's going to have relevance in that practice world. There will always be a need for research that illuminates human phenomena, that shines a light on things that are, that are relevant to people, that, that puts it into relief so that we can see it in a way we might not have thought of it before. And this is particularly the case in the clinical and applied fields in which you get used to seeing things. We might, you know, we might uh, if something's not, not extreme suffering, we might not see it as a form of suffering, for example. And so by shining a light on it, you can bring it back into consciousness in a way that can have some meaning for practice. 
An important use for this kind of qualitative research is also variance interpreter. When I was referring to sample size earlier, I would never suggest that there's a magic number you can say, if I interviewed 300 patients, I would have all variations on any phenomenon you can think of. There is no magic number. But if I know that excellence in practice is, is dependent on that capacity to be able to notice variance and understand what it might mean, and that therefore and act on it, then I can generate my studies that are not simply looking for commonalities, but helping people understand how certain kinds of diversities manifest themselves. And as I produce knowledge that helps us think about variants, how to spot it, what, what sense to make of it, how to work with it, then we are generating the kind of knowledge that it will help people move toward that excellent thinking and that practice wisdom over time. There will always be uh, aspects of the way we design systems, the way we deliver care, the way things exist in the world that deserve a very healthy qualitative challenge to say, do you know that if you're doing it in this way, this is the effect that it has on human beings? So there will be advocacy work that is tailor-made to this kind of research as well. And finally, there will always be uh, work that is needed to humanize experiences, human experiences in the social and healthcare world, to bring them to life, to put names and faces to them, so that the person who may have, have uh, you know, very good skills with the technical uh, aspect of something can begin to understand it in the human context. So all of this is really a matter of thinking about understanding that applied and practice world and building into a study that, that way of thinking about the nature of knowledge and the need for knowledge and the who are the people who need to take up that knowledge and in what context and for what purpose and what difference can it make. And by having that consciousness from the very beginning of a study through every step of the design decisions that you make, um, you, you will be able to produce findings that have that knowledge translation capacity from the outset. And so as we work with this method, that, that uh, every new wonderful insight that you bring back to the clinical field that inspires people to think about or do things differently will shape action and bring back new questions. So it becomes a continual dialectic between action and inquiry. And I know I've said a lot in this brief period of time. There's so much more to be said. Um, there are a few key resources I've listed here, uh, many of them quite accessible to you. And you'll be able to look at these slides later um, if you're at all interested in the, these resources. There's so much wonderful scholarship out there on all aspects of design once you get the philosophy and once you get the courage to make those design decisions and defend those design decisions that make best sense for your understanding of your discipline and your substantive problem and the, the need for knowledge in that field. So I'll leave you with um, the, the resources for where you get further access on these masterclass webinars. I invite you to reflect on what I've said and see how it might apply in a minor part or in a major part to the kinds of research that you do so that you can ensure that the studies you design and enact are studies that are, are well suited to really making a difference in the world for the reasons that you've entered the kinds of applied and practice disciplines that you did in the first place. Thank you so very much for listening, and I'm hoping that we have an opportunity to discuss some of the ideas that I've raised. Thank you very much, uh, Sally, for, for the presentation. Um, so we have a long list of questions here, and uh, what I would like to do is offer people who ask those questions, offer them the microphone, and you will tell, tell us if you would like to speak. So I would like to start by offering the, uh, the, the microphone to, uh, and everybody, please apologize. My apologies if, the, if I do not pronounce your name in the right way. Uh, but uh, Stein, uh, you have a question. Uh, would you like to 
uh, to speak. If you do, just click on the hand icon and I will, uh, in the control panel, I mean, and I will be able to uh, offer you the microphone. Let me see here, Stein, in the, uh, in the long list of, of people, we have 197 people today. So let me see here, Stein. Okay, so your hand is raised. I'm gonna give you the microphone. Go ahead and ask your question out loud, please. Hello, Sally, and thank you for the presentation. Um, Sally, I'd like to ask you, I have been, um, I've got some questions on my own research. I have used ID for um, my um, PhD studies and um, I've, what I've got most critique on is my um, approach on being both constructivistic and naturalistic. And I would like, maybe you can elaborate on that um, in the way that it's debatable and um, yeah, that, that's what I would say. And maybe could you give an example on how would you perhaps demonstrate um, um, analysis in that epistemology? So that's my question, <laughs> short. <laughs> that's an excellent question. Thank and you. It, it's probably a question that, that, that um, many others have that's the kind of question that's specific to your own context and the communities in which you're developing your own scholarship. Um, and I say that because if, if the tension between those two sort of philosophical perspectives is being raised as a problem in your research, then it implies to me that somebody is believing that you need to sit your, situate yourself firmly in one or another. Um, I understand philosophically why someone might make that position, especially from a social science perspective, or if you're a health science researcher who did, had your training in research in the health sciences, you may, you may believe that that theoretical and philosophical positioning is essential and, and um, fundamental to research. I, as a, as a nurse scholar, however, I would say that it's not. And I would say that uh, I would expect a nurse to be able to, to think about what the world looks like from a constructive of this perspective in which things aren't necessarily just the way they are, they're, they're there because we're constructing and, and interpreting them in a social context all the time and a naturalistic context. So that, that it, it's useful, of course, to be able to understand those traditions and understand where they came from, but not necessarily to feel that you must, as an applied practice scholar, locate yourself in one or the other. So that's a very good example of the, 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 the way that philosophical, that theoretical tension plays itself out into the universe. Now, I can't tell you or any of you how best to respond to your own uh, supervisors and colleagues and mentors or to your own scholarly communities. If there are strong views that all qual qualitative research is only of high quality, if you attach yourself to a theoretical position, then that's a battle that you will need to fight. Sometimes people have found it helpful um, simply to say, I'm actually not using um, constructivism as an overarching theoretical framework. It's an idea that I take up in certain ways for certain purposes in the way I think about these three phenomena within my field of study. Uh, but uh, my, my work is much more pragmatic in the sense of recognizing that multiple philosophical lenses can be useful to, to asking the questions and inquiring in a fulsome way about a clinical phenomenon so that I can then make choices about what are the best ways of presenting findings that are going to meet the actual need. So I've talked around your question rather than answering it directly, um, but I, I appreciate it because it is exactly the kind of problem that many, many people have. In, Without without a reference point like interpretive description, you may feel you need to cave and say, okay, no, I'm just going to take one position and go forward. And that might be a useful intellectual exercise, but it might not lend toward the kind of robust and rich 
and nuanced knowledge that your clinical colleagues would appreciate as being relevant to the field. And it's that sort of problem that I'm really hoping to give people courage and confidence and a reference point because we've all learned that if you, you, you can't simply say, I thought it up myself. If you've got a reference point and say, say these, these authors in the literature confirm that this is a reasonable way to think that that helps you go forward. So I wish you luck with that. Uh, there, there won't be an easy answer, but I appreciate the question because it, 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 it will be a familiar question, even if it's different th theoretical perspectives to many people listening. Thank you very much. So uh, let's see, we have 10 more minutes and a, a long list of questions. Uh, let me be careful here so that I can I can uh, address all questions as much as possible. So um, uh, Jennifer, uh, you have a question and Jennifer is asking, uh, how can we borrow from different traditions without cherry picking? Yeah, I think cherry picking is the kind of language that people use when they're trying to disparage um, a method other than the coherent um, original tradition. Uh, they might use method slurring or sloppy methodology. Those are the terms that you will find um, from an external examiner or a reviewer. Um, if they truly believe that integrity with research means that you take a whole tradition and uh, apply it in the way that it was intended. And I'm not going to argue with the social sciences because I actually think that the methods that were developed for the, those ways of advancing knowledge within the social sciences work very well for the intended purpose. It's just that they don't always work well in the health sciences. And the reason I, and there are many others who are also working on different ways of approaching applied methods, but the reason all of us got into it is that, that there very often are fundamental problems between the conventional method and the kinds of applications that make best sense to creating really meaningful and really usable knowledge in the applied field. So I would, I would uh, uh, recognize that a language like cherry picking is sounding eclectic and atheoretical. Instead to say, I am actually following a line of reasoning and my job is not to simply say, I did this and did this and did this, but I'm showing you the interior logic from the very question that I asked through every step of design that aligns these things together. And so, yes, I can tell you that I have uh, done interviewing in a particular way and I've approached analysis in a certain way and I can critically reflect throughout my study on the impact on why I made the decision the way I did, what the implications of it are, what its strengths or weaknesses might be, and what its implications would be on the findings. So don't be too scared of that language. It is pretty familiar uh, language in challenging anything that steps away from what somebody might think of as a, a, a specific convention you're supposed to be following. Thank you, Sally. There is another question from Ramani. Romani uh, wrote a few questions, but I'm going to only pick up one of them. But if you would like to speak, Romani, just let us know by clicking on the hands icon next to your name. Romani is asking, can one add and use other approaches like empiricism and or realism or critical realism under the interpretive description? description? Um, yeah, I think you can. I think that... that um... In the early days when the health science began to take up qualitative research, we fully believed that it was impossible in the same human being researcher to both be able to do quantitative research properly and qualitative research properly. We thought of them as paradigmatically different and once you'd seen the light about qualitative research, you could never go back. Nowadays, fortunately, we don't feel that way. And in the applied and clinical world, when we confront the, the universes of possibility, the things that are the things we need knowledge about there in order to do things better and, 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 and in a more coherent way and to serve more people, for example, we always, if we're honest about it, see things that we should be measuring and th see things that we should be documenting and see things we should be investigating qualitatively. So I see absolutely no 
philosophical problem. I think that that um, being able to understand what's the nature of the question that I have at the at this moment, and does it lend itself toward a a, a qualitative approach? So something like critical realism, which is which is a, a kind of form of of realism, um, is is perhaps um, interest philosophically challenging for anyone in healthcare but it it takes as a fundamental sense that there are things that actually have material properties and other kinds of properties that exist and i don't think a qualitative researcher i don't think any health scientist is rejecting the idea that there are certain truths for example people have pain it may be humanly expressed humanly differently but pain exists um, and so I think that we, we in the applied world have to function it's moving back and forth between those traditions instead of saying firmly, I philosophically hold with one side or the other. Um, and I, I think that is really a, one of the fundamental differences that we are pragmatically driven by our current understanding of the nature of that world out there. And it has all of those possibilities within it. Thank you, Sally. I'm going to offer the microphone to Yuri. He uh, or she has a couple of questions. Uh, please go ahead. And you could start um, hello, by can you hear me? Located. Yes. yes. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, hi, my name is Yuri. Uh, I'm in the US. Um, thank you for providing this informative webinar first. So According to the philosophy of the interpretive description, uh, are we interpreting the data we have based on our clinical experience and the literature? Uh, I'm asking this question because I remember that from your book, uh, you said the words and phrases and codes stick out because we are interested in them. Then what do you think of bracketing from this perspective and the rigor of the qualitative study? Um, I've argued, uh, thank you so much for the question. I've, I've argued that um, we, we, we don't bracket out all that we know. In fact, the, 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 the thing that legitimizes our asking a question is our knowledge of that practice field. We ask a question. I ask questions about cancer communication because I understand how powerfully that communication affects human experience. And it's it's that, that I can't I can't bracket away that understanding and that commitment. What I don't come into a study with is saying um, I know that one theoretical perspective will always be the right answer, or that I have predetermined the answers. In other words, I am in, I ensure that I am asking a legitimate question. And that's why a question like what can be learned pushes me always beyond what we already know. And to say, is there anything more that we should be knowing that I can now gather by virtue of, of this study? So um, we, we, we take that entry into the field and I think we unashamedly do that. And we consider our disciplinary lens to be what the equivalent might be of a theoretical framework in the social sciences. It's a thing we can't get rid of. I can't get rid of being a nurse. You can't get rid of whatever it is, whatever applied disciplinary perspective you, you brought into it. Now, at the same time though, I would not say that that necessarily gives me the, the right answer on all questions. And it's quite useful to be critically reflective and to say, are there, some, are there some things that I'm seeing in a particular way because I'm a nurse that somebody else might not have seen? And might I be biased in that way? Uh, are there some problems with that? And so because of this, um, rather than the conventional uh, uh, quality criteria to measure the rigor of a study, such as fit, does it fit with an existing literature, which I, I think is not really a relevant quality criterion. Um, in the interpreter description book, we proposed a number of others, you know, things like, you know, sort of pro pragmatic obligation, does it, does it actually work in the practice field, uh, a moral coherence, that kind of thing. So a, an alternative set of evaluation criteria that you could use to determine whether the product of a qualitative study is in fact useful. But I thank you for your question because it helps to clarify how that disciplinary perspective works and, and to confirm that it isn't necessarily uncritically positively held. There may be some things that that disciplinary perspective also obscures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally and everybody else. Uh, we are really running out of time and we have a long list of questions. 
Sally, would it, uh, would it be okay if people can write to you and um, communicate with you directly? Um, I'd be happy to receive some questions. I, some of them uh, I may not be able to answer by email. And so uh, if, if people can look back to the readings, many of them may well be answered in the readings. But certainly if there's a particular question that someone cannot uh, uh, answer in that way, I'd be very happy to respond. Okay, and thank my, you very my much. Email, my email address is on the slide. Okay, now, uh, Juliana, uh, I would like to ask you to say a few words before we close. Thank you so much, Ricardo, and thank you, Sally, for that very thorough and well-presented uh, introduction to interpretive description. I very much enjoyed it, as I'm sure all of our attendees did as well. Uh, Sally had mentioned there is an archived masterclass webinars site uh, I'd also like to point out, and thank you, Sally, for including the link to our IIQM blog, which we have breathed life into for the first time in a number of years. So um, please do watch that blog, both for um, the link to the archive, which you see here, as well as upcoming masterclass webinars, of which we have a couple yet to go here in May. Catherine Houghton, uh, next May, or next week on May 7th, and uh, um, Kendra Rieger, pardon me, Rieger, and Christina West at the end of May on May 28th. So thank you both, Ricardo and Sally, again for this presentation today. Thank you very much, Juliana. A few, a few closing remarks. Uh, we are now in our seventh year of this very successful uh, program, and we are going to go now into our eighth year starting in, in June. Uh, and the success of this program uh, is due to your participation. So we really encourage you to continue coming to these webinars uh, and, um, and make this a success, especially now given the circumstances in which we are all living. I just wanted to say that we are planning a very interesting uh, webinar uh, for some time in June, perhaps. It's going to be a virtual round table. Uh, that is, we're going to have uh, presenters from different countries talking about how they have adapted their uh, their their, uh, their research practices uh, during this uh, pandemic. And uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, roundtable. And if you have ideas or would like to perhaps participate as a presenter, uh, um, uh, 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 Juliana, I would like to invite you to uh, communicate with us, right? And, and, and perhaps uh, we can uh, talk with you about that. Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, is there an email, Juliana, people can use to communicate with, with, with us? Absolutely. IIQM at ualberta.ca would be the preferred email at this stage. Okay. Thank you very much, Juliana. And on the website I'm showing you, uh, you can also see the list of archived webinars where you will be able to download the, the slideshows as well as watch the videos and webinars go all the way back to 2013. So there is a lot, a lot of videos uh, to watch while you are at home. Thank you all of you. Thank you, Dr. Thorne. Would you like to say any uh, final and closing, closing remarks, Sally? I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this this topic, and uh, I hope it's, although it's been a whirlwind, I hope it's met some of the needs out there. Thank you very much, Sally. Thank you very much, Juliana, and thank you very much, all of you who came from so many different countries. Have a very good remaining of the day and remaining of the week and your life. Bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>